afternoon, everybody. Everybody excited to be here? Welcome to the opening new Oxford Houses panel. Today we will be hearing from Aaron Vick from Outreach in Oklahoma, Michael McKeho, Outreach Senior Outreach in Florida, Elizabeth Smith, she is Outreach in Oregon, and George Kent, the Regional Manager for the eastern side of the country, northeastern. Just a couple of, of announcements. Um, as a reminder, you must wear your, wear your face, face mask over your nose and cover in your mouth at all times. Your lanyards and your name badges are required to enter, enter sessions. Silent your cell phones. Be respectful to the colored bracelets that we handed out yesterday. Keep your QR code on your name badge clear so we can let you into your sessions. The only smoking, smoking and vaping area that we have is outside between the ballroom and the parking garage. Don't smoke near the doors and please dispose of your butts properly. Don't forget to rate the sessions on the convention app. The AA meeting has been moved to National Harbor 3 and the NA meeting has been moved to National Harbor Room 10. Okay, Oxford houses need to continually open new Oxford houses to meet the demand for beds. Oxford house expansion happened in the early years because members of existing Oxford houses found new houses to rent and some members of the older Oxford houses would move in to get the houses running. This can and still should be happening. The early members of Oxford house were particularly adept in convincing new members to do most of the work themselves, the Tom Sawyer effect. It worked, and it worked then and it can still work now. Outreach workers can also be used as a resource, as a resource person by the individual Oxford houses and chapters that want to learn how to start new houses. This panel will review the basic elements involved in finding a new house. What's an appropriate house in the neighborhood and what should be done once a possible house is identified. The panelists are all experienced in helping new, open new Oxford houses and they will discuss what it takes to open new Oxford houses and identify practices that will and won't work. Our first speaker is Aaron Vick. He will be telling you guys about how to find a house. Aaron is a board member of the Big Ben Mental Health Coalition. He's a board member of the SUF, FSU Institute for Justice and Development Community Action Team. And he is a board member of newly emerging recovery organization. organization. Oh, that's not Aaron, guys. <laughs> That is really impressive. <laughs> so that was Michael. Okay. Aaron Vick is the senior outreach coordinator. He's been an employee since November of 2017. Moved into his first Oxford house. Of <laughs> Aaron Vick's gonna come up here and tell you guys about himself. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. So I'm Aaron, my, my name's Aaron Vick. I'm a person in long-term recovery. What that means to me is I've been clean and sober since November 10th, 2016. Um, I'm, I'm the field worker in Oklahoma City. I've, I've taken part in opening uh, several houses and moving several Oxford houses uh, as a as a resident and as an employee um, you know so the the first thing we're going to kind of go over today is you know if, if we if an area decides they want to open an Oxford house you know where do you start to look you know I, I know for me um, that was something I had to I had to a big learning curve I had no no idea about real estate or anything involved in that kind of stuff so you know, I, I kind of had to learn by, learn on the fly. And, uh, you know, I, I start my day off looking on Zillow every morning, you know, whether 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 we're, we're expanding or, or not in the area that I've been, you know, because you might find the perfect Oxford house, you know, whenever you're not even looking. Um, you know, there's Zillow.com, there's Realtor.com. Um, I've got a couple real estate agents that I that I work with on a on a on a daily basis, you know, if I if I find a, uh, if, if we find a house on Zillow, you know, we need a way to go look at it, you know? So I'll send her the address and, and she'll set up an appointment for us to go look at it. 
and it and it's good to have relationships with with some real real estate agents in the in the area. Um, another avenue is rental rental companies. You know, companies that manage rental houses and stuff like that. Um, you know, you can always find good good Oxford houses that way also. Um, another another good resource is existing landlords. You know, landlords that already have other Oxford houses. You know. They might have houses that they're willing to rent that were rented at the time, or, or they might have other ones that they're willing to rent, or they might be willing to go buy, buy a new house if, if asked. Um, and then, you know, as, as an outreach worker, you know, I get calls all the time about people looking uh, interested in opening an Oxford house, you know, so they call and ask me, you know, um, how would they go about that? You know, I also have re residents members uh chapter leadership you know that that know people and talk to people about the oxford house model and that you know that's another another good way to get people interested and get new people bring new people into the fold um and another good 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 thing to do is just you know i'll be driving driving in a neighborhood and and there'll be a for rent or a for sale sign in a in a in a, in a neighborhood and i'll be like Man, that looks like a great oxford house that could be a great oxford house um so the, the next thing is uh, what to look for. You know, that's, that's a big one. You know, that's a huge one because there's houses I see all the time that, you know, see them on Zillow or see them by doing drive-bys and think that they'd, be, they'd make a great Oxford house. And there's one little thing that prevents them from being a great Oxford house, you know? So um, setting up a time to go tour those houses is, is, is very, very, very important and what we're looking for, you know, we're looking for nice houses in nice neighborhoods. Like that's a must, you know, it, we, we can't be going to the, to, the, to the lower end areas of town, you know, expecting people new in recovery to recover in those areas. Um, you know, you have to, whenever you do that, that walkthrough, you know, you have, to, you have to look at the bedrooms, you know, how many bathrooms, there might only be one bathroom in a house with, you're going to have nine or 10 guys in there. That's not going to work. You know, that's not going to work. Um, parking, parking's another big thing. You know, if there's only parking for, for two or three people, you know, and you're going to, you're going to fit nine or 10 guys in there. That's an automatic no, you know? And, uh, you know, the, the next thing you need to really take into account is, is there entry level employment around where the house is going to be at? You know, is there is there public transportation around where the house is going to be at? Because I know for me, when I decided I wanted to get sober, I, I wasn't on a winning streak. I didn't have a lot left. You know, I was broke. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a driver's license. You know, I, I needed to rely on those entry level jobs and, and that public transportation to get around early in my recovery. Um, another thing is, uh, are there 12 step meetings close by? Sorry. So if, if all of those things, you know, materialize and, and it looks good, it looks like it's a, it's a potential Oxford house and that, you know, what's the next step? Um, you know, it, it really, it, there's, there's some best practices, you know, if we're, if we're working with a new, with a new investor or a new landlord, you know, you want to be a hundred percent upfront and honest with them. You know, don't, don't make promises that you can't keep. Um, don't, don't get the house into a bind down the road. Um, the way I was trained is always think what that house will look like in three, four or five, six years down the road, you know, because we want people to move in and stay because that'll, that, that'll, that'll, that, that'll fix the long-term stability of the house. If people move in, they like it and they stay, you know? Um, like I was talking about earlier, the parking situation, you know, you know, if there's only parking for three or four cars and it's a 10 person house and every time you're having to, you're, you want to go to leave, you got to wake somebody up to move their car to leave. You know, people are going to be looking for their first exit out of that house if that's the case. Um, and the next thing is, is be upfront and honest with, with, with the landlord about any remodeling or, um, any repairs that need to be done, you know, there's a lot of times we got to go into houses and add walls and in second living rooms or dining rooms. And, uh, we need to be upfront and honest with them about that. We don't need to make a deal and then tell them that those things need to be done. 
and and don't get involved in that. You know, we 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 let the landlord know what needs to be done, and and they handle that. Um, and then you know, whenever you're talking about a price, you know, how much we could pay for for the monthly rent, you know, let them throw out a number first. We sh we shouldn't be well. We can give you this amount. No, let let them go first. Um, you know, an another big thing is, uh, and I know some areas do it and some don't, we do it in Oklahoma, is, uh, you know, we, we really sell the landlord on not charging us the first month's rent and, and, and no, no security deposit. And, and I know that's a hard sell at times. Um, but it's actually, I I've done it on multiple occasions and, and, if we're if we're coming in the door paying the first month in a, in a security deposit, you know, it really puts the house in a financial bind, you know, and it and, and it and it might work and it might not. Um, but usually, if you explain that to them, you know, they 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 see where you're coming from and 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 you can get that achieved. Um, the next thing is, you know, I it's okay to say no. Like if if you walk into a house and and there's one bathroom and you you're going to put ten people in there. You know, it's okay to say no. You know, I, I can't tell you how many how many houses I've looked at that would make perfect Oxford houses, and and there's one little tiny thing that that prevents it from that, and I want to say yes so bad because it'd be a great house, and and I and I can't do that because three, four, or five years down the road, that house is always going to have problems because of that one thing. So, that's all I got. Thank you. I'm gonna introduce Michael McKeho for the second time. <laughs> Michael McKeho is gonna be speaking about setting up a house. He is a senior outreach coordinator. He's been employed with Oxford House since November of 2017. He moved into his first Oxford House of August 2016. He's worked for states such as Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida. He, besides working for Oxford House, he is a board member of the Big Bend Mental Health Coalition. He is a board member of the, of the FSU Institute for Justice Research and Development Community Action Team. And he is also a board member of newly emerging recovery community organization for Tallahassee, Florida. Michael will be talking to you guys about how to set up the Oxford House. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, so my name is Michael McKeo. Um, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I live in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, I've had uh, the honor of being able to work for Oxford House in four different states now. Um, I've been able to open uh, the first two houses in Alabama and Florida. Um, and so the Oxford House uh, setup process is um, it's a little complex, um, but it's fairly easy to accomplish um, with some planning. Uh, so getting a team is essential to getting all the things needed for a house and doing it in a way where we're not going to spend a large chunk of the startup money because uh, we're given limited funds or even in some areas, there's no funds at all. Um, and we're having to pull from the association or the chapter. Um, and so we gotta be very frugal in how um, we're deciding to spend money uh, for an Oxford house. And so sitting down with this team or this group of people, developing a checklist of everything that is needed for a house, um, it's really essential. Uh, and then meeting on a pretty regular basis uh, until the house is gonna open to make sure that everything is being obtained. Um, but how do we do that? So. A few kind of tips that I would give would be to start with a letter asking for donations, asking for the things that are on your checklist, uh, developing this letter to be able to pass out to the recovery community, uh, to different community organizations, uh, just uh, family and friends, people you know, um, to be able to pass out and give, give to anybody that might be able to help. Um, any Oxford house can take up to a $1,000 uh, donation directly without having it to go through OHI. Um, 
And, and so it's, we can take cash donations as well. And that helps tremendously. Um, so sitting down, developing this list out, um, getting, the don getting as many donations as possible um, is really one of the best ways to start. Uh, so you have somebody who wants to donate couches, somebody who wants to donate some kitchen wares, um, things of that nature. Um, and so we do need to make sure that we're checking all these boxes though. And, and so sometimes you can't get everything donated. Um, and so going to uh, estate sales, going to thrift stores, garage sales, um, hitting up all these different places, but take that letter with you. You go into these places, um, you tell them what it is you're trying to do. Um, like a lot of estate sales, you go in, say, hey, will you cut me a deal if I buy all these dressers that you have? Um, or when the estate sale is over, if you have leftover items, will you donate them, donate them to us? Um, I've gotten a lot of people this give me almost a half a house worth of furniture without any problem when the estate sale turns up and there's all kinds of things left over. Uh, and so think outside the box, um, work with your group, work with your team, your chapter, um, and making sure that you're searching out every avenue. Um, Cause the goal is to be able to spend as little money as possible while getting everything you need, um, but being decent stuff. Uh, so we don't want to pick up mattresses or couches off the side of the road. Um, we don't, <laughs> we don't want to buy uh, mattresses at thrift stores that have holes in them. Um, it's not a bad idea to buy some used mattresses if they're good name brand. Um, I would recommend that you put them in a mattress cover because um, even uh, a mattress or a couch at a thrift store might have some bugs on them um, and that can be a big issue. Um, I'd say after going to these different stores, um, uh, thrift stores, real estate, or estate sales, then usually the day of the opening of the house, I'd go to Dollar Tree first. Always go to Dollar Tree first. Yeah. You can find a lot of things you didn't think that you could find at Dollar Tree for a dollar. Um, so fill that buggy up. Um, and then proceed to go to Walmart um, or Sam's Club or something and get the rest of the things that you need for that house. Um, and so you're always keeping your eye on the budget, always making sure that you're trying to be as frugal as possible um, so that when you get to that day, that house opening, um, you can fill that house with the furniture, with the, need, the needed items for that house immediately. Um, and it's essential. And so. Setting up the house um, should be highly encouraged to, to be done day of within the first 24 hours. Um, and why do we do that? Number one, to get people that need a place to live into that house ASAP. Um, a lot of areas when they decide they need a house, um, it's because they have overflow. Um, and, and so they open the house and there's people waiting to come there. So get that house open, get those people into a safe environment, uh, get them into a place where they're gonna get some recovery. Um, a lot of places that have multiple houses, it's opening new, they'll have core members. It's good to encourage them to, to move in that house to help it get set up. Um, let's see here. I highly encourage taking pictures the first day. Once you get it set up, um, make, the, make a flyer that you can pass out to the community. You got pristine pictures. The house has never been lived in. Um, it's perfectly set up. It's the perfect opportunity uh, to get the pictures for the community. If you, do, if you wait a month or a couple months, then you go in and try to take pictures the house maybe not a mess, but it's cluttered and it's more difficult to get it like you'd like it. Um, and also, if there's people in the community that wanna see the house, uh, get them involved, tell them to come out and, and see the house that same day when you have it set up uh, so that they can see that house in that pristine condition um, and see what this new resource is gonna be for their community. Uh, it's really cool to be able to see, especially in new areas, like I opened the first house in Alabama, um, 
brought these people into this house and like, wow, this is really cool. We've never even seen anything like this. And, and so it, walking a person through a house day one um, will inevitably get you these referral agencies to just send people. Um, it, it, just tell them about Oxford House wh while you're walking through it. Uh, explain the process, show them the officer binders, um, and just uh, it'll sell itself when you're doing that. Um, and so I highly encourage you to, to reach out to those places day one. Get it set up um, as soon as possible and get it ready. Make sure the grass is cut though. <laughs> um, other than that, uh, just make sure you get all the safety items that you need for the house. Uh, the fire extinguisher, smoke detectors, carbon mon monoxide detectors, and Narcan. Please get Narcan. Make sure that your house, the houses in your area, always have Narcan in them. It's super important. It saves lives. That's all I got, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Our third speaker is Elizabeth Smith. She's been in long-term recovery since March 8th of 2010. She has worked for Oxford House. She's worked for Oxford House for three and a half years and been part of opening over 20 Oxford Houses. She is currently the training and education coordinator of the Oxford House in Oregon, and she is gonna be sharing with you guys about working with new members. Thank you, Brittany. Well, let me get disconnected here. <laughs> Hi, family. So I would like to start this off by telling you a story why I'm here. So in October of 2010, my treatment center gave me a pass to go do an interview at an Oxford house. I showed up at this Oxford house and these women sat down with me. They offered me breakfast. They offered me coffee, and they looked at me, a felon, a drug addict, somebody who didn't have any money, didn't have a job, doesn't have good job history, and they said, please come live with us. Welcome home. That's the whole reason why I'm here today, why I love talking about this. So let me find my arrow. I wanna to talk to you about what you, the members, can do, what your role is. So the very first thing is, it begins at that interview, that moment where somebody comes to your house. Like I said, those women opened their doors, they opened up their home for me. They made it feel welcoming. Especially right now, while we're in a pandemic, remembering that you need to be adaptable. There's some people who aren't gonna be comfortable with that in-person interview offering a mass, offering them another option, being able to do Zoom or a phone interview, whatever they're comfortable with, to be able to bring them into this safe house. The other part of that is when I moved into that house, I came straight from a treatment center. I had two black trash bags full of clothes. I had some books and I had a pumpkin. And that's it. <laughs> I had nothing else to my name. And when I got there, those women, they had bedding on my bed. They had a pillow for me. They had a closet where they had toiletries. They showed me what cupboard I could get food out of if I needed it. And they walked me through the house and showed me what my area was, what my next chore would be, talked me through the whole thing, and kept doing so for quite a while. The beds that you have... If you're filling those beds, you need new Oxford houses, right? Filling those beds, making it a safe place for that next woman, that next man to move into, doing those presentations at treatment centers, jails, any kind of community outreach that you guys have, telling your story, talking about this, and filling those beds, creating that need for that next house. Building up the current houses, using your resources, 
training that next person when they come in, not just handing them some paperwork and saying, house meeting's Thursday at eight, you better be there. There's a lot of houses that do that. You know, that's really setting people up for failure. So giving them that opportunity to fill those beds, doing those trainings, talking about what's expected of somebody when they come in is absolutely huge. Focusing on unity and recovery, having those house dinners together, having movie night, having game night, having those recovery meetings that y'all go to or y'all put on Zoom in the living room, that really makes the house. Again, trainings. A lot of people don't even know what the model is. Houses have books in them for a reason. You guys are all gonna have chapter manuals, you're gonna have house manuals, you're gonna have these resources. Show people where they are, go over them, read a full tradition at every house meeting. Not just that little one sentence, I know it's really long, but going through the whole tradition at a house meeting. How do you inspire that next core member? So it really does begin at that interview. You know, that's why I moved into that Oxford house is because I felt welcome. I had no clue what I was getting into. When they asked me what I had to offer an Oxford house, I drew a blank. I couldn't think of anything that I had to offer that house. Yet they told me, we want you to come and live with us. Recognizing what skills that person has, what you can encourage, what you can build upon, what strengths they have, and what strengths they don't have that you might need to work with for a while. You got tools for those too. Involve others in the process. So when I go to open an Oxford house, I talk to the chapter about it. I pitch it to them, I let them know, do you guys want to open this Oxford house? Cool, who wants to be involved? You know, it's not my house. It's not that one chapter chair who's really excited to get the sweet room, you know? It's not, it's an Oxford house. It's everybody's house. It's those men or women moving in right then, and it's the next cycle of them coming through. So involve everybody in that process. Really importantly, Ask people, what do you want to see in your house? What does your house look like? How do you support that new Oxford house once you find it? Encourage people, this is your house. Make it yours. You know, you guys decide what the chores are. You guys decide what night you're having the meeting on. You guys decide where the beds go, where the couch goes, all of these things, what artwork you're gonna put up, everything, involve people in that. Asking again, what can you bring from your last house? What did you like about it? What do you wanna implement in this house? Also, what didn't work at that house? What would you like to leave behind and start new with this house? Again, utilize local houses, chapters, or state for support. If you don't have a local chapter or state association, reach out to a nearby one. I know I'm perfectly happy to answer my phone any day and time and give suggestions. Reach out to your community partners. Do those presentations. Let them know about the vacancy website. Let them know how to get into your house. And really importantly, when you're in that house, be a good neighbor. We don't have to live like we used to. I know uh, during the pandemic, we opened an Oxford house, the first Oxford house in this town in Oregon called Lake Oswego. <laughs> There's some of my Oregon people laughing. So Lake Oswego is a very affluent neighborhood. Um, I know I can't afford a house there by any means. Um, and we had this guy who wanted to rent us, seriously, his million dollar tree house. It's amazing. And when we got into that house, I don't know what's unavailable, but when we got into that house, they, um, the landlord told me, the next door neighbor 
is 89 years old. She lives on her own. I have a pressure washer in my garage. Can you guys commit to going over there every other week and pressure washing her driveway? And absolutely, those guys went over there. They went over there with cookies and they pressure wash her driveway and they are friends with everybody in that neighborhood. It was absolutely not what I expected. Um, having that open house after you all are there, having a barbecue, giving people the opportunity to see that you're just a family. You're just like them. We're not as scary as they think they are, you know? Um, most importantly, I would like to end this with an ask. Tell your story. By telling your story, that's how we begin to heal. And that's also how we inspire people. Thank you. Okay, our fourth speaker is George Kent. He moved into his first Oxford house in April of 2005. He opened his first Oxford house in 2007. Since then, he has opened houses in 10 different states. He's currently the regional manager leading the team in the northeast part of the country. Thanks, Brittany. And these guys had some good stuff. I, I, I said I was gonna like write, uh, talk about what they didn't say. I'm crossing stuff off my list. So these are, these are just some seasoned professionals over here. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I forget who was talking about, about opening up Oxford houses. At, oh, she was just talking about a tree house. Um, I opened up a house. Well, first let me say, I. I personally, and I could be wrong, do not believe in Mr. Malloy and Steve Poland could probably vouch. I don't believe that anybody's opened more houses that got us into court than me. You know, um, I've been in federal court with Steve all over the, the country and just fighting these cases. And Dr. DuPont said something that is so true about Paul. Every house matters to him. Every single one. I have seen Mr. Malloy fight battles in these neighborhoods where the house is probably going to close, but he, he's not backing down. You know, he's fighting that battle. And um, they all matter to him, everyone. And, you know, and my role is, uh, you know, I, I work with Kathleen and I get these emails from Paul and you never know which one he's going to be really interested in because to him, they all matter, like every single one. So I, I got to constantly make sure that I have knowledge of, of what's going on. But I was thinking about this one area. I opened this house in, uh, in New Jersey. It's, uh, it's like you can see Manhattan from it. And, and the, the claim to fame is Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen live there, right? It's a big affluent area. And um, you know, all the neighbors have Range Rovers and stuff and all, all these, you know, nice cars. And one guy had a car with a little tick, 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 you know, like when he's leaving the driveway and stuff. So anyway, long story short is they, uh, we end up in court, you know, because I don't know how it is in every area. And, and I've, you know, gotten open houses in a lot of different areas. Different towns have different policies when it comes to renting a home. Some towns might require the landlord to get a renter's registration. Some towns might do nothing. Well, this town did nothing. Um, until we come and now they have a process where you got to go down to town hall and you know find out because um, they found out that we were there and uh, unfortunately there was a there was an overdose and that's how we kind of came on the map and um, we had gotten into a lot of battles with the town and um, I don't even know how long ago this was but uh, I agreed to like go meet with the neighbors at a church and it was like you know they were gonna you know lynch me or something I, I showed up and all they wanted to hear was we're leaving, you know, sorry, we're leaving. And I started out by saying, well, we're not gonna leave, but you know, we're gonna try to, you know, work this out. So it was all downhill from the beginning. But uh, knowing that, you know, Mr. Malloy and Steve Poland, you know, essentially had my back and, and in a good way are, are arrogant about the fact that we deserve to live in every community that's available for us, regardless of where it is, um, I felt, you know, comfortable standing my ground with them, you know, and, I remember they uh, they started, you know, how they are. They complain about everything. You know, the cars on the sidewalk, the cars this, the cars that, and um, we were we ended up in federal court, right? They we kept fighting, and um, they wanted us not to go there. 
and uh, me arrogantly. I tried to rent another house in the town while we're in court, you know. And of course, and of course, the neighbors like you, you know. It, what was crazy with the whole thing is we got a lot of support, but they weren't the vocal people. The vocal people are the people that didn't want us, you know. There's a lot of people that, you know, got my email and, and would email me and say, hey, we, you know, we'd love to do this, but right now is not the right time because, you know, the, the neighbors were just ruthless towards the homeowner, you know, go to his wife's work and play and all these kind of things. Um, but, you know, when I tried to rent that house, it was more like, you know, letting them know we're not afraid, you know, we're definitely not going anywhere. And, um, and we, we put a lot of resources and stuff into keeping that house. And you know how they got us out? This, this, oh, we're on tape. But uh, this upset me. The town bought the house, you know? <laughs> the town bought the house to make it affordable housing, you know, because in New Jersey you get tax credits for affordable housing and stuff like that. So that's how they got us out. They bought the house. Um, and I don't feel, I mean, I, I was a little upset with the landlord for selling it, but, you know, he got 850000 So, I mean, how upset can you be for the guy, you know? So it was like, um, but anyway, you know, that's a long way of saying, you know, um, legally there's some things we probably need to look at when we're, when we're, you know, opening Oxford houses. And the biggest one that I can say, and I think uh, either Aaron or Michael talked about it, is, um, you know, sometimes you got to, recreate the interior space of a house to make it fit the amount of people that we need to live there, right? And um, something when I work with my staff is, um, that's cool, we just need to do it legally. You know, because legally I know we can live in any neighborhood, but I promise you that township ain't gonna give us any free passes. Yeah, that wall shouldn't be there, but you can have it. They're not gonna do that. You know, so when we go into a house and we have to, you know, convert a second dining room or whatever it is, you know, making sure that the landlord's pulling permits. And, and he also made a good point was like letting them do that all on their own, because, you know, I've had various times early on, um, we, you know, the houses that I, you know, I guess I'll call it inherited because I didn't open them, um, had people in the basement and had, you know, some places where they probably shouldn't be. And um, that's a big thing that we got to be conscious of. I mean, I've seen some houses that have people in the basements. But there's only a few that were the proper way, and those are the ones I'm talking about. I mean, I don't know what all the code is, but usually, like, those little windows way up high, that's not a bedroom. You know, the way they explained it to me was, if my bedroom door is on fire, how am I getting out? I'm not getting out that little thing, you know, that little wall. So normally it has to be a special egress window in the, in the basement and stuff like that, which is very important because, um, man, uh, we, we had uh, some, I guess we'll call them fake actors, you know, uh, recovery houses in the area. And one of the houses had 13 people living in a three bedroom, right? Um, it wasn't an Oxford house and uh, the house caught on fire. And unfortunately, one of the guys didn't make it out of the basement, right? And what really hurt was that kid was supposed to move into an Oxford house in two days. So, you know, it, it's very personal that we make sure that, you know, regardless of the inconvenience of others, because sometimes people like to have their single room instead of, you know, having to share a room, I mean, safety has to come first, especially, you know, doing it the proper way, because there's nothing that's, you know, a bigger pain is like thinking that a house is one way and then finding out you can't use it. And then everybody's all pissed off because, like you said, the guy likes to have a girlfriend over, whatever it may be, and it's not set up properly. So making sure that the, the space is used legally. Um, and again, each town is different. Some places have different codes. You know, um, I was working with the guys in Maryland now. I mean, they have less codes in New Jersey. It's like, forget it. You know, the guy comes out with a little tape measure and stuff and sprays this thing in the, in the smoke detector to make sure, sure the thing beeps and stuff. In other places, they don't do that. So it's important to know what is and isn't okay in the areas that you work with. Um, and something else, I mean, it's part of opening a house, but I guess it affects. I'm a big picture guy. So if the house down the road looks like crap, doesn't take in their trash properly, their can's blown down the road. Um, that affects us opening up the next Oxford house. I've learned that, you know, because I had an instance where, you know, we had a landlord that had a house for rent and we approached them and he said, well, my sister lives next door to an Oxford house and I've, I've driven by that house, they don't take care of that, so I'm gonna pass. You know, so, so the actions of one house directly affected, you know, the ability to open other houses. So we never know who's looking, you know, or who's who. Um, and I've had also situations where we had, you know, the town found out we were there and, you know, they cried, they didn't want us. And everybody said, how can they be there? And, and all these kind of things. Um, is there any convicts that live there? And, you know, and again, this is what I love about Mr. Malloy. See, we boldly proclaim that most 
large majority of our people have spent at least a night or more in jail. So the mission of that statement, I believe, was to say that we transform from the old lifestyle. Unfortunately, the, uh, the public or the people that don't get this, I'll just call that category, see that a whole different way, you know? Um, matter of fact, with the, with the case I was talking about in Rumson in uh, New Jersey was like, they brought that up. They said, on your website, it says that people have been to jail, you know, and, and I'm like trying to minimize it. I was like, you know, shoplifting, you know, maybe at a DWI, <laughs> you know, DWI. It's like, great, now I can't leave my car unlocked and my kids can't play in the street. You know, like that's how they heard it, you know. But sometimes we're proud of these things, you know, that, you know, we transform from that. Um, so the point of that is that, you know, people are watching. Even the houses in existence can directly affect us opening up other ho Oxford houses. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, uh, and I've been guilty of this, is sometimes uh, we fall in love with opening up a house, and um, by opening up that house, we hurt another house, right? Um, and that happens often, and sometimes we're upgrading or, or whatever it may be, but that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, when those scenarios popped up, the solution that I found, like I'll use down by the Jersey Shore, what we did is you could live on the ocean and pay 150 a week or live on the bay with the flies and pay 120, you know? So it was in the same town. But if you're, if, if you're asked to pay 150 to live on the ocean, 150 pay to live on the bay, you're always gonna wanna live in the ocean, the house on the bay is gonna struggle. So if, if there are two houses in an area, stuff like that, you might wanna try to think about that, you know? And, it, and two, it gives options to all people of all incomes too. So it isn't like, I can't afford to live in that town because the EES is this much or whatever it may be. Um, because I've seen a lot of houses struggle and then, who uh, who takes the brunt? Usually the chapters bailing them out. Houses are tired of helping, and then you know eventually the house ends up closing and stuff like that. Um, so that's definitely something to be mindful of. Is you know the other houses in the area. And years ago, uh, I don't know, probably the the states with outreach in them. We do these activity reports. How many people applied? How many people you let in? How many people relapsed? Why they relapsed? You know where did they go? Um, in the beginning, and we probably still do, that data gave us an idea of where more houses were needed. You know, it was like this house in, I don't know, Atlantic City, there's 15 guys, application, they only let in one guy. Where'd the 14 go? You know, that kind of gives you an idea. You know what, there might be another house needed in that area if each month we're still seeing that many applications and stuff like that. Um, and two, sometimes that's an indicator of uh, that house and whatever they're doing is popular, maybe we need to replicate whatever they're doing. You know, I've seen uh, some houses that, um, talking about it before, uh, that ha I'll go back to the house in Rumson. Those guys were probably never gonna be able to live in that town on their own ever again, but collectively we could afford it, you know? I mean, New Jersey is just ridiculous in property taxes, but I mean, the landlord paid 30 grand a year in property tax. That's like, what is that? $2,500 a month just for taxes. So he owns the home and you still gotta pay 2,500. So it's very you know, hard for someone to live in those towns. So um, that's why you know, we try to make them affordable and try to set them up properly and the longevity. Somebody else talked about that. You know, what is the house gonna look like in a couple of years? Are we gonna be able to stay there for an extended period of time? Um, and what I was taught early on is, would I wanna live in that house? You know. I've seen some houses I wouldn't want to live in. I'll tell you that. I'll be, you know, I'll be honest with you. There's a few, and usually I'm trying to be part of that, you know, process of finding a new location for those. But that's a big thing too, is you know, finding a house that we'd be okay living in, you know, and be proud of that, you know, um, because this is a big thing. I mean, this there's a lot of people in this room. This is like my first, you know, convention. I don't remember there being, you know, more than a couple hundred people here, and now it's probably the best part, time ever to be part of Oxford House. Well, it's very hard to open houses because that's a, a big part of my role is, you know, the housing market's crazy and, you know, you can't evict people that aren't paying their rent. So like renters don't want to rent to you right now because they're afraid, you know, we're, you know, <laughs> the idea of us renting, they, we might fall into that category, not being able to pay and not getting the hell out. Um, so they're fearful to rent to us. Um, so the other thing, uh, back in, and I'm all over the place, but um, <clears throat> the activity report um, kind of gave that, that uh, information. And something, too, is uh, I, I know you guys are probably familiar with the text message thing you get. 
when the vacancy is. And, and Tim, who, who started it, was in my chapter, right, when he first started it. We started in the chapter in New Jersey. And the initial use, which I, I loved, and he was you know, very innovative of thinking that, is we would do the text, and there was probably eight houses or something at the time, so everybody, we got the vacancies. And what we used them for is we would get that, he'd screenshot it, and we had 100 treatment centers emails, and we force-fed them every Monday. They got where the vacancies are at. Boom, we're giving them to you. So it helped us keep us on the map even when the counselors weren't thinking about Oxford House because they were getting that email every Monday. I mean, we probably got more people asking to take me off the damn email list because they kept getting them. <laughs> but um, it was a great tool to help fill the houses. I mean, that chapter of eight became like 22 because we constantly were first feeding them. So when we're looking to fill the beds and we're looking to get people in the houses, um, am I going over here? Um, is making sure that the numbers on the website are right too. I just want to mention that because, you know, I, as a leadership role, I, I get that a lot. We're not getting any calls. It's like, who the hell's number is this? Oh, that's somebody who used to live here. It's like, no wonder you're not getting any calls, you know? So, and, and a big part is we've got a very custom to that, that Oxford House, Oxford vacancy website, and we put our information, the contact, and the number. But I could tell you, not most people that don't know about Oxford House don't know about that site. So most people are going to the oxfordhouse.org. So that number on that website is very important to make sure that it matches something that someone will answer. You know, and that could be a resident, or that could be, I know some places create a, create a, a, Google, a Google voice number, so that way you can point it to whoever's cell phone that that person moves out. You still have the same phone number, you just point it to someone else's new phone number. Um, but, uh, well, it's a big role of the staff that I work with to open up houses. Um, I got this role by opening up houses before I became staff. You know, they sent me all over. I was open houses in Michigan, and you ever been to Erie, Pennsylvania? Scary place. You know, I, I've been to some, you know, some different places. And what I've enjoyed is you know, people do recovery different. They close their meetings different. All these kind of things. But um, the core principles continue to stay the same. You know, we're all equal. We all got to pay our own way. And you got to get the hell out if you screwed up. And, and, and remember this, and this isn't part of the topic, but we vote on whether a relapse occurred, not whether that person's staying or not. You know, that's the vote. Did a relapse occur? The decision was already made by Mr. Malloy and them. My daughter's FaceTiming me and stuff. Um, because sometimes I, I've seen that get screwed up. And again, that's a, that's a big picture thing that could screw up, uh, you know, other houses is... Uh, you know, us expanding is, you know, we're allowing people that, you know, and going to, now I'm getting off topic, but going to treatment <clears throat> and holding the bed, I'm not sure is immediately evicting somebody either, but that's for a different topic, you know. We need to make the bed available for somebody to move in. We need to continue to do what Mr. Malloy and Witt and the other guys kind of came up then is still time tested and still works today. And what I love and I don't love is there's a lot of room for interpretation and in a lot of this stuff. And I think that's deliberate, you know, because as we evolve and stuff like that, but sometimes we want the, you know, to be able to say, well, this says you got to get the hell out or this says this. And there's not a whole lot of that. So we have a little bit of creative freedom based on our experience in the recovery meetings on um, this. I was taught what's God's will. My will is what's good for me. God's will is what's good for everybody, including me, you know, and sometimes it's hard to vote in a way that doesn't necessarily benefit me, but it's gonna benefit the group. Because again, this is about moving forward. We need more houses, not less. So um, that's all I got. I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you, George. Can we get a round of applause for everybody that shared up here? So we have a, roughly about 20 minutes left. There is a microphone right in the middle right here. If you have any questions, please line up here and ask your questions. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I am an alcoholic and an addict from Kansas City, Missouri. Hi. So how do you go about, or have you came across a situation where you want a house that has a homeowners association? <laughs> Um, oh, we have a microphone. Hello. Uh, so, honestly, I don't. I don't recommend homeowners associations. Um, I know that we have several houses that are in them. Whether they were formed before we got there or not, I do not know. I know that I have had one 
negative experience with a homeowners association. And I've also had one really positive one. So again, a lot of the time it comes down to being that good neighbor. They're worried about the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. As long as you are holding up the standards that they wanna see, it doesn't matter what you're doing inside the house. You guys can recover. It has to do with reading what is expected of you and participating in that. Being that person who is willing to show up to those homeowner association meetings and communicate about the neighborhood and be an active part in it. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, thank you for uh, coming here. Uh, my name is Jesus, I'm an addict uh, from Kansas City also. Uh, my question is, what would you do to, uh, what if you had a landlord that you that you called upon to come and check out your house, you know, your air conditioner's not working, the toilet's flooding, whatever, and you have a set rent of so-and-so money, but at the end of that month, when you go to pay your rent, you notice they're tacking on money. What do you do about that? They're tacking on money Onto the rent that so, you got to pay now because you have a contract to pay rent and that's part of the rent. So they're adding money for what? Yeah. The, you, you call them up to come and check out the air conditioner's not working or whatever. They come and clean it. You know, it's all part of the stuff that we would require a landlord to come do, you right. know, to check out the house. Uh, and they're charging you for that. And they're charging us for that. Yeah, so Something you gotta like that, yeah. look at the lease. Um, if you don't have a copy of the lease, you can call OHI um, and get it, or your local outreach worker would probably be the easiest option. All right. Um, it, but it should be in the file cabinet from when the house first opened. Um, and see what it states. If it doesn't state that you're, the house is responsible for those, then you have to have a conversation uh, with that landlord and right. say, this is not in the lease that we agreed to. Um, and usually uh, some outside help, uh, outreach worker, um, right. or calling the main office, asking for their help if you don't have one. Um, but yeah, if, if it's not part of the lease, we don't need to pay it. And so continue paying the lease as you should, uh, continue paying the amount of money that the lease states and just move forward. Um, and if they got a problem with it, um, then they can talk to, the outreach Outreach worker, whomever that may be. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate your time. Hi, how you guys doing? My name is Sean, uh, Kansas Oxford House Chapter Woo! One. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Woo! Uh, my question is, when opening a new house, what is like the best ratio for seasoned members to new members? Obviously, we're opening this house because we need newer members, but obviously, we need seasoned members in there as well to replicate. So, what is like the good ratio, a good ratio for season members to new members? I mean, my, my experience, uh, one, two, I mean, okay. this depends on the area, the size, the chapter. Um, but if you can stick two guys in there that are seasoned, I think that that's a good start for sure. All right. Anybody else? Cool, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jesse McKinney. I'm a, a grateful alcoholic addict. And uh, just get just overwhelmed with gratitude. I want to thank everybody here. It's made this possible uh, for me and so many others. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling to be here. And I got to give a shout out to Jesse Wilson and Jordan Link for uh, being there, holding me accountable, running me through some books. And, uh, and that's, that's made it possible for me to go from North Carolina to, to Bradenton, Florida, is where I met Tyler So I just want to give a shout out to him. Uh, he's put up with a lot. Uh, actually got the privilege to, to be part of helping starting up the first Oxford House in Bradenton. And uh, just, just wanted to show some gratitude for everybody, man. Uh, go Oxford. <laughs> you know, thank y'all. <laughs> thank you. Hello, I'm Kimberly from Colorado Springs, HSC for Chapter 12. Um, I just wanted to ask, is there a conflict of interest with members opening up houses? And like, let's say they're, uh, they open up a house and they're dating a member that lives in that house, even though it's their house, it, would there be some sort of conflict of interest? <laughs> so let's say their family like bought this house, opened it up for Oxford with Oxford, but a member moved in that they're dating. And if so, like, is there a way to go about that? I mean, I feel everybody should be accepted. And the only line I, I've had to cross was when an actual family member owned the house, and then the family member couldn't live in the house. 
I don't know about boyfriend, girlfriend. I don't know if that came up yet, maybe. Huh. Okay. I know family members, it's just been too much of a conflict of interest. And, and can I ask in what way? Like, is it uh, just like favoritism? Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we uh, gosh, I don't know if it's legality, but we, in the house in New York, oh, I shouldn't have said where I was. Um, and there was another place too. Um, it was just we didn't want to have a family member live in there. They seemed to. Uh, the, the landlord always went to the family member. The family member felt like they, um, you know, had a little bit more say. And it's hard to be equal expense shared and equally democratic when you have a, a, a little bit more of an interest mm -hmm. in that house. You know, okay. so that's mainly the reason that we expressed it. And then also there was one more, and I do apologize. Um, what about? Uh, what about transgender people moving into other houses as well? Sure. Uh, now that they may cover in the legal thing, and I'll give you how it is explained to me. Um, in those certain uh, circumstances, we've allowed that member that's interviewing to decide what gender house they want to interview at. We didn't okay. decide for them where they could interview. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hey, my name is Michael. I'm from Oxford in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> um, my, my question was, uh, um, I'm from Georgia and been to treatment several times in Georgia and only know of one Oxford house in Georgia. So maybe, Michael, since you're more in like that southeastern, is there opportunities with Georgia to open more houses there, like get involved that way? You could be it. <laughs> yeah, honestly, um you could you could be it and we're gonna need um probably a few houses to open up by people in communities um in order to get something going in order for the state to see um the success of oxford house i know that they've had difficulties working with the department there that is over that um and so if you know people in the treatment field or you as a citizen or um family members call the, um, the Substance Abuse Administration in Georgia and have conversations with them. Um, I'd say that that would be the best course of action, um, but that's gonna be a difficult process. And so if you're really passionate about it, be willing to make a lot of phone calls, uh, be willing to hear no quite a bit, um, but ultimately it's something that we've dealt with a lot in, in different states and there's definitely hope for it. I mean, Oxford House, is the best and we just gotta uh, show them that we can provide uh, in Georgia what we do in other states, so. Sweet, thank you. Uh, my name's Cordia from oh, Pensacola, Florida. Um, so what do we do in a situation where our chapter, every house in our chapter is working off a of waiting list and we have three or four interviews, every house meeting. Open, and open, open. There's no new houses. There's no houses to open because the housing market is complete crap. So I've called every surrounding chapter to see if they had beds open. They don't have women's or women and children beds open. So, so I'm actually over that area and I'll be working with Chris um, <laughs> uh, to really find houses for y'all. Okay. Um, but y'all can be involved in that process and should be. Okay. And so there are houses no matter what the market's like, there's always somebody that's got a house that would be willing to lease to Oxford House. We just need to find them. Okay. Um, and, and so we'll get there, um, but definitely step up and um, get others involved with that process. All right. So, Thank you. Not a problem. Hi, I'm Natasha Hill, and I'm with um, Oxford. I am New Outreach, Colorado Springs. Um, and I do have, I have a couple of questions. Um, on the no charging first month's rent and security deposit, how would you go about that? Like, just what would you ask? What would you just suggest? Just blatantly tell the, the people that you're working with the, to lease the house to you. Um, like, we, one of the big selling points might be to do a two or three year lease. Um, and if we can do that, maybe you can give us the first month and no security deposit or a greatly reduced cost. Um, a lot of different Oxford House outreach workers work with people that buy houses. I prefer to find a house that is currently on the market for lease 
Um, but I know if you're working with one of those investor types, um, that they're very easy to work with as far as that goes. And you can pretty much just tell them that's what we want to do. And that's the only way we're going to do it. Okay. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> my other question is opening a house in um, a city or a town that does not have an Oxford house, but also does not have um, recovery surrounding it. It's difficult. So I was just speaking with uh, two of the women who are in South Dakota. Um, there's only a few houses, and that's exactly what they were talking about, is how do we get the word out about this? There's only a few meetings, and they're very specific types of meetings that aren't necessarily the people that are going to Oxford houses. Um, and the first thing that I suggested was, is there a meeting hall? Is there a church nearby? Be the one who starts a new meeting. That's what I thought. Okay. Start that meeting, start that recovery, and let the people see your story. Let them hear about Oxford House through your story. Okay. Um, and then just one other simple other question. Um, I know about donations and getting donations. Um, and sometimes that can be uh, you're getting donations of couches and beds. Uh, we would spoke on that earlier about getting um, mattress covers. What do you do in a situation when, even though you've already did those steps and we've actually, a house ends up with something, what are those steps for that? Ends up with what, bugs? Bugs. <laughs> yeah, it can be expensive, um, but that's mainly the, the main issue. Um, and so calling all the different pest control places in the city, have them come out and give an estimate. Um, maybe getting the homeowner to cover the cost at first if we are short on funds and obviously chapter support donations from outside other oxford house groups um we don't want to like let the community really know about that so we're probably not right. going to ask them for donations about that um because that can be i mean ultimately we could be oh that's the bed bug house and we don't want to be that and so um but taking care of it is soon as possible soon. Um, by any which means okay all right thank you thank you hi i'm amber i'm from uh from san antonio and if you want to open up another woman and children's home what what should you go and what what ages can you choose mm -hmm. you know to be in there because i'm in a woman children's home at, and back in san antonio and you know we have a six month old but you know can, can, it, can it goes up to a certain age or what do you do yeah i don't know if we have a specific limit um i think it's definitely um i'd, I'd go to the chapter first about opening the new house um, oh, okay. and, and get the outreach worker involved um and decide like when where how what's gonna do and I mean, I've been in certain instances where an outreach worker says, no, we, we're not going to open a house right now. But the chapter says, screw you. Uh, we need a house. We're going to do it. Um, and so, like, if you have that kind of support and, um, and that's something you're dealing with, um, it goes a long way to, to have that big group of people saying, hey, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it with or without you. Um, and so, like, it ultimately helps, though, to have the outreach worker on your side. Um, and so when you get to the point of opening the house, you can vote on the age limit. All right. And also one more question. Yeah. I mean, when the only issue I've ever seen is when it's the opposite sex gender age limit becomes an issue, like a teenage girl in a male house or a teenage boy in a girl house, you might want to take that into consideration when you're setting some type of guidelines up because that's probably where it gets tricky. Okay. Oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> and also one more thing, if you want to name an Oxford house, I mean, do, does it, do we have to go to outreach to get it or, or what is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got to be approved that it hasn't been used somewhere else. So you can't have, you know, you don't have the same name somewhere like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name's Aurelia and I'm a grateful recovering addict. Um, I'm from the chapter one in California. Um, my uh, question would be, what would be your best advice um, to give to a small chapter that's struggling to pay EES and struggling with vacancies? Stick together. 
No. We got to work together as a team to get out of that. That's been my only experience. I don't know if you guys have any other. Would it be um would it be overstepping our boundaries to call upon like other resources in the community for um help, uh financial help because I constantly feel that like my house is always struggling to pay ES. We're always struggling to, um, you know, fill our vacancies. Um, our chapter is really small. There's only two men's houses and one women and children's house. And uh, there's one NA meeting in the area. <laughs> there's a uh, one, there's like maybe, well, there's an AA meeting every day, but it's about it. We've done fundraising. I, I see you want to be careful with becoming fully self-supporting. <clears throat> subsidized from some government funding kind of thing so I would suggest you know probably doing like a lot of fundraisers um, I remember one chapter we did uh, raffles like every single chapter so you could probably do a fundraiser but reach out to the public whether you know whatever it is um, you know selling cookies or whatever you, you whatever you guys are good at you could probably set it up and uh, you're probably um, likely to find people that want to support the cause and don't care about the product. You know, they want to be more a part of doing stuff like that. But that's probably the best way would be to do fundraisers and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lamont. Um, so I heard, I kept hearing about the need for areas. If there's a need in an area for a house, how does one gauge if there is a need in an area? Uh, who is the area, and how does how does that how does that conversation arise? Does it start from a house member in a house, say an HSR says, "Hey, we need more houses." Does it does it have to come from the top to the bottom? I mean, that would probably be the simplest thing. If you have a lot of houses that have a lot of vacancies, adding to that thing, you know, it's probably going to hurt. It's probably going to hurt the case. So if you got three half fold houses, you add another one, you might have fourth for you know one third of the way house is full and what i said the uh when you're seeing how many people are applying to a house and how pe many people are actually getting in where's the other people going that's usually a good gauge on um you know you know knowing if it, you can support it because i've had a lot of agencies come to us and say you know we could fill the house right now there's a big difference between getting a house full and keeping a house full you know so you need that continually flow of things because you might get eight people that have been waiting for the house to fall and then the phone might not ring for three months so you want to gauge that too is there going to be continual interest and stuff like that and that's why these guys talk about it finding houses that there's desirable for people to move in because the worst thing you can do is have this great idea and get this crappy house and then no one even wants to move in there it was kind of counterproductive to what you're trying to do okay and secondly um someone touched on it with the name uh how does who, who decides on the name of her for a house uh, and yeah, who decides on the name for how? Does it have to be named after the street? No, I, I, <laughs> that's really. I mean, it's really unoriginal. But hey, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, how does one name sure. a house? <laughs> you could produce a name and run it by and see if it could be used. Usually, uh, if you um, go through the main office, there's a girl there that you know does all the name checking and hasn't been used before, hasn't been used before. Yeah, that's really the process, you know, and uh, probably something that couldn't make us look weird, you know, like it wouldn't kind of call it a Oxford stripper or something, you know, like you, you'd want to be, you know, conscious of that. Yes. Okay. And who is the organization that, who, who approves the names? If you call the main office, they would, you know, the, the, the main number, they could direct you to whoever's doing it. Cause sometimes that role switches. So I don't want to give you one name and then. Okay. So it's not done at a chapter level. And then they changed. What's it's not that? done at the chapter. It's not done at the chapter level. It, it's higher up. It, chapter. Well, it could be suggest. Well, when to apply for, uh, a charter talk about this when you apply for the charter yes. you have to have a name yes so that paperwork goes to oxford house incorporated because they're the people that issues the charter so they okay. essentially are the end all on that part okay so you may and i've had this happen you may even submit the paperwork and they may contact whoever the contact person is and say hey oxford house joe smith has already been used and then okay. you gotta you know you can call joe smith too or you can find a new name okay so but usually you probably want to figure out the name before you get in the tax ID and all those other kind of things set up because then it's kind of, you know, silly. Okay, thanks for your time. Hi, I'm Ashley from Kansas, chapter Woo! six. <laughs> um, our house is an hour and a half away from the rest of our chapter. And we are having a hard time filling our vacancies and um, 
I just want to know if it would be smart for our house to move closer to our chapter because there's there's better recovery in the town that the rest of the houses are at. Um, the only issue is the town that we're in does have a women's reintegration, and that's where we were getting most of our people, but it's just, we've had two people living in our house for the last four months, and it's just been us two trying to keep this house open. Um, so I just kind of wanted your advice if you think that we should shut that house down and open a new one closer to our chapter, try to keep this house open and open another house. What is the best way to go about this? I, I don't think we can recommend closing any houses. Right. Um, especially in our roles. Um, but I think you, maybe a house in between. Start there and then who knows, maybe the resources might start stretching out. Okay. <laughs> being able sorry having that bridge to be able to su support that house and like he said we absolutely aren't going to tell you to close a house that's the right. exact opposite of what we're doing here right but you know what can you do to support that house and it might be opening that other house halfway in between just to keep that connection and that support okay. um i don't know what's going on in that area because i don't know it but definitely speaking with any treatment centers, any recovery centers, absolutely anything, and trying to gauge that support and build it up. Because a lot of the time, these people, they don't even know you're there, right. you know? And getting the word out there. Okay. Definitely doing fundraisers. People love food, you know? They, they love hearing speakers, uh, doing whatever you can to, to make them aware of you. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Gabby, uh, Chapter 5 Chairperson for Northern Virginia, or Hi, in Gabby. the Northern Virginia area, I should say. Um, we have four women's houses in our, I should say, county, Fairfax County, 20 minutes from here, but I'm originally from Loudoun County, and we don't have any women's Oxford houses there. I think part of it is because it's the richest county in America, but there is a need for it, and they don't really talk about addiction, and they're just starting to talk about mental health issues. But there's lots of recovery places, detox, and then they have clubs, you know, for AA and NA that you can go to. Um, how would I, Do you have that would be a separate chapter for me. So would I have to, um, I don't know how, what I have to do to kind of get myself qualified to open. do you have an outreach worker in your area debbie i think she's all of northern virginia debbie okay, robinson so give her a call um and help her find a house that's really the main thing finding mm -hmm. an affordable house it sounds like you have everything else in place yeah um, they've told me before that um there's not she didn't tell me someone else told me there's no need for a woman's house in that area and i said there is another sober living house but it's not Oxford it's some place called Serenity House and it's seven hundred and fifty dollars a month and nobody can afford that even people that are from Northern Virginia and you're young and that's why Oxford's great because it's affordable and it's just a lot of structure even more than some of these other sober living so you, you've spoken with her before a uh, different person that used to be on the state association okay. um, I haven't talked to Debbie about it because yeah, we're trying to get the Give People Debbie in a our call. chapter filled and everything. So. Give Debbie a call. Tell her you sat in this panel and you're interested in starting a new house in a new area. Okay. Thank you. All right. Last one. We're over time. Hi. I'm Ashley. I'm from Florida, Chapter 7. Um, <laughs> I'm, I live in Tampa, but I'm originally from South Hillsborough County, which is where we're at. But there is a problem. We need houses in Southern Hillsborough County. It's so bad so bad but there's no public transportation to one specific town um and then the other one of the other towns there's only one bus that runs on the main highway how do you open a house when one of your biggest draws is i myself don't have a car um and i have to use the bus every day how can we get a house open without 
public transport would public transportation be an issue? So likely, I mean, honestly, we'd avoid that area because there's so many other areas right by there um, that are not very far away. Um, and I get like how people might have a job there or a family there, um, but in reality, it's just going to be easier to have successful Oxford houses in the area 20 miles away that has everything we need. Um, and, and so it's not something that, that is just a hard no, it, but, and there has to be some solutions um, and a good game plan. So if this is something you're passionate about, um, I'd say come up with a good game plan and then continuously bring it to chapter and, and build on that plan until something succeeds. Mm -hmm.